So welcome everybody to the second of the four special events associated with this course. Um, so specifically, this is the second of four special events associated with the Harvard Law School course on copyright and with the Copyright X course. Um, the topic for today will be copyright law and development. We have the great good fortune of having as our principal speaker, Ruth Okedici, uh, who's one of the experts in this area. Um, I had the uh, honor of having her as a student in one of my first courses on international intellectual property law um, quite a long time ago. And she's gone on to become one of the leading lights in this field, uh, both as an academic uh, and as a um, practitioner and negotiator. So she's currently uh, the Prosser Professor of Law at the University of Minnesota. She has taught um, at many other institutions, uh, including the Max Planck Institute in Germany. Uh, she has also uh, worked for, in a high-level capacity, the World Intellectual Property Organization. Uh, so she knows the process of uh, managing international intellectual property law from the inside. Uh, and last but not least, she was the representative of Nigeria this past um, year in the negotiation of the Marrakesh Treaty, which, as you know, involves uh, mandatory access to copyrighted works on behalf of the visually impaired. So um, she knows this field from many different directions. Here's how I hope to um, organize the event. Uh, she's going to speak for the, about the first 20 to 25 minutes about the topic of copyright law and development. Uh, then the middle portion of the event will be devoted to questions um, submitted primarily by the leaders of the satellite courses. So as those of you in the room know, uh, there are 10 um, satellites to Copyright X um, being offered by experts in copyright law uh, located in um, many countries throughout the world. And some of those countries would qualify as developing countries. So the leaders of those satellites um, have been encouraged to submit questions. Some of them they've submitted in advance, and some they may be submitting live based upon the um, uh, insight, wisdom, and worries they have about the copyright system and development. So we collectively, Ruth and I, will engage these questions in the middle third of the event. And then the last third will be a general uh, question and answer period um, in which please do ask questions yourself. And we will also, I hope, be getting questions from the online audiences as well. Uh, so because we're working in a regular block of time here, there is a crisp ending time, which is 1140. We'll keep to that. So please welcome Ruth Akedeshi. All right, I think I'm on. Can, can you all hear me? All right, good morning. Um, it feels really um, strange to be speaking in Professor Fisher's class. And you know, the minute I walk in, I forget that I'm a law professor. I'm, immediately, I become a student again. And um, I want to say thank you for the invitation and the honor of being part of this course. So this is a topic that is near and dear to my heart <clears throat> uh, for a number of reasons. And I will be expressing some of those reasons over the course of the next 20 minutes. Um, but to begin with, I think I should start with a caveat that when we talk about copyright and development, we are not talking necessarily about the geopolitics, um, what it means to be a developing country um, in the context of the international copyright system. But as you will see, uh, that plays a very significant role in how international copyright and in fact, national copyright laws um, are both designed um, and the kinds of uh, regulations 
um, and institutions that countries uh, vest with the responsibility for, for copyright. So the, the text is a bit small, but I thought I might give you a bit of a background about the landscape of the copyright system and how the question of development uh, has become so integral to that process. So back, of course, when the United States itself was a developing country, we had a policy. And that policy was uh, for many, many years that if you were the author of, the foreign author of a work protected by copyright, that your copyright interests really did not matter within the geographical boundaries of the United States. And we were what many people refer to today as a pirate nation. I actually do not agree or like that terminology, but nonetheless, that's what you will see in the literature. Um, and that was probably the, the most celebrated historical account of this idea that copyright law has something to do with a country's development. Um, the U.S. was very explicit about its policy on a number of fronts, and there are still elements of that policy in our copyright statute today. Uh, so if you were the author of a work, um, you were not a U.S. citizen or domiciled in the United States, um, U.S. printers, publishers, um, the public could uh, reproduce and make those works available to the larger American public. Uh, in fact, we had something called the Manufacturing Clause, which was a provision in our statute that said um, any works that would be protected under copyright law in the United States uh, had to have been printed um, in the United States. Now, interestingly, that was not a provision that was directed at the benefit of authors. It was really to protect the publishing industry. Um, but be that as it may, you might uh, fairly intuit that there was um, much easier access for the American public. Um, and Congress and, and several of the uh, policy papers from um, the uh, era was clear that we wanted to build a literate, um, democratically engaged uh, society. Um, access to works of literature from Europe were critical uh, for this enterprise as the public uh, itself began to develop, um, and we began to grow our own domestic um, um, authorial class. Right? But let me say that even though the US example is the example that you will hear about and that is much often talked about in, in, in the current political environment when developing countries are making arguments for particular concessions in the copyright system, um, that this was the status quo. This was not unusual, and, and even though many European countries were not as blatant as the United States in, in the um, efforts to educate and to make works available uh, to the public, um, it was very clear in the history of the first um, uh, international copyright convention, the Berne Convention for the Protection of the Berne Protection for Literary and Artistic Works, it was clear that countries all internally had a way of dealing first with the need for the public to have access to copyrighted works, particularly for what we might call today uh, democratic engagement. But what at the time was also part of educating the public, and so this was as much about having access to news and cultural events as it was to having access to um, works for educational purposes. And every country had its own balance internally. One of the things that happened um, as the Berne Convention was being negotiated was the idea that we needed to focus on what was necessary to incentivize authorship. Um, and that we really could not agree as an international community on what kinds of exceptions are necessary for each country to uh, facilitate its own economic growth and its own uh, social de uh, development. Um, some of you may know, for example, that uh, taking an example from today, that in China, uh, copyright protection um, is very separate um, and regulated distinctly from, say, uh, concerns about freedom of the press um, and what the public ought to have access to. In other countries, the United States would be a prime example, concerns about freedom of expression and copyright are intricately woven. Um, and so as countries decided to participate in the international system, there was always this question of whether 
the copyright regime ought to be about incentivizing the production of literary works and artistic works, um, and that the question of development or public interest or access to copyright is principally a question to be resolved at the national level. And so if you look at the history of international copyright law from um, uh, the late 1800s, you will see that this has been the structure of the law. The questions of social welfare, public interest, development were always principally dealt with at the national level. And at the international level, what we did was to emphasize the kinds of rights, the kinds of interests that might be necessary to facilitate investment in, in, in authorship and works of authorship. But that's all changed now. And since 1994, the uh, agreement on trade-related aspects of intellectual property really catalyzed um, a change in the structure of international copyright and, frankly, in the structure of domestic copyright as well. Uh, we, of course, in the United States, um, changed um, a number of things um, in our laws to satisfy the requirements of the Berne Convention. Um, not enough if you talk to our European trade partners, but we certainly did make some changes. Um, and there are those who would argue that we are still not fully compliant, myself included. There are clearly areas in which our laws are not compliant. Those pockets of resistance, as I call them, are pockets of resistance that have to do very deeply with both our democratic ideals and our sense of what is beneficial for the American society. And one of the things that's critically important for developing countries, um, whether they are in Africa or uh, Asia or Latin and South America, is the opportunity to make those policy choices themselves. What kinds of exceptions and limitations what kinds of policy considerations ought to go into the design of a national copyright system. Now, there is um, an unfortunate development in international copyright because, as I said earlier, starting from the mid-1800s, the role of the international copyright system was really to find areas of convergence. Um, it was a thin level of harmonization. And the idea was to leave issues of the social welfare and public interest to the national um, uh, domestic context. That has now been radically flipped since 1994, where the international system has occupied a much bigger policy space. And this is particularly true for developing countries, in part because the democratic institutions that would create a buffer between public interest concerns and concerns about the functioning of the authorial market do not exist um, or are very immature in most of these countries. And in some countries, frankly, they're non-existent. And so the capacity of the national copyright system to calibrate around issues of development, issues of the public interest, issues of cultural engagement, has been significantly weakened um, since 1994. What's interesting about the year 1994, of course, is that um, this was the year, of course, that TRIPS was concluded. Um, but TRIPS really did not radically change the Berne Convention, right? Um, the TRIPS agreement, in fact, copyright, the copyright space is a space that was least disrupted um, with the conclusion of TRIPS. Um, what we see in the TRIPS agreement, the provisions on copyright, um, are things that clarified national practices. For example, the idea expression uh, distinction, which had never been codified in an international treaty, was codified in the TRIPS agreement. Uh, the protection of computer software as literary works, recognized explicitly um, in the context of um, the TRIPS um, agreement. Um, and then, of course, we uh, saw for the first time Article 9.2 of the Berne Convention which was the only place in which uh, countries for many years could agree about the role of public policy in copyright design, uh, which was to say, if you're going to create exceptions to the right of reproduction, you had to limit those exceptions um, based on something we now refer to as the three-step test. And so this was a provision in the Berne Convention that um, was probably the most direct uh, affront to the kind of national policy space that countries could utilize for um, development purposes. Article 
uh, uh, sort of got um, expanded, broadened, um, and the three-step test now applies to every copyright interest, um, every copyright right that is recognized um, in the TRIPS um, agreement and, um, of course, um, by incorporation, the Berne Convention. So any time a country, this is in theory how it's supposed to work, any time a country is thinking about, well, we need an exception, for example, for distance education, or we need an exception for um, uh, the distribution of works to students, or we need an exception, we need bulk copies to hand out in the context of the classroom. Those countries, in thinking about what necessary exceptions they need, have to make sure that those exceptions are consistent with this three-step test. Now, lots of conversation that we could have about that, um, but I want to leave it at that um, for now because it is a very controversial piece of the international copyright system. As a result of what the TRIPS agreement did, however, um, most consumers in the developing world have, and, and frankly in the developed world, have been increasingly frustrated with the copyright system. And that is true in the United States, and that is true, of course, um, in the least developed parts of the world um, as well. Um, and so I mentioned in the slides that since about 1994, we have seen a steady concern about whether copyright law is achieving its goals. We've seen concern about what those goals ought to be um, and who gets to decide. Are we doing more at the global level now than countries are allowed to do um, at the national level? Back in the 1970s, when you thought about the notion of development, um, the idea was that if developing countries were going to become part of the international copyright system, which would have required them to have domestic copyright systems, that if they were going to do that, then um, development had to be the quid pro quo. Development had to be a condition. And by development in the 1970s, just after the colonial uh, um, age was, was coming to an end, development at the time really meant economic development. It meant giving countries the freedom to enact copyright laws and other associated legal regimes that would meet the kinds of basic needs that those countries had. So for example, in, in, in 1976, um, WIPO, the World Intellectual Property Organization, uh, was faced with an existential threat. Um, the United Nations had its own intellectual property unit within UNESCO, and UNESCO had come up with a copyright um, treaty the Universal Copyright Convention, the UCC, which nobody ever talks about anymore, but the UCC was sort of a, a burn light. It was an international copyright treaty that recognized minimum rights, but also had a fairly nice set of exceptions, um, a balance that many developing countries thought they could live with. And so many developing countries had actually ratified the UCC. The US had ratified the UCC because up until that time, still in the 70s, the US had not um, felt comfortable with the high level of protection in the Berne Convention. Well, WIPO saw this happening and realized if we have a competing international copyright system, the Berne Convention um, is going to be um, in jeopardy. But also, of course, the sheer numbers of the developing countries post-independence right, would have overwhelmed um, clearly um, the UCC and would have made it um, a much more influential international um, um, instrument. And so uh, through a series of negotiations, um, WIPO began to engage India, in particular Brazil, um, S South Africa, several of the what we call the BRICS countries now. And India, in particular, was extremely vociferous about the importance of development and said, we've got to educate the millions of people we have within our borders. We've got to educate our societies. We need to produce literate societies. We need capacity for our schools to have cheap access to educational materials. The African countries jumped on board, Brazil jumped on board, and to cut a long story short, in the late 1970s, we come up with something called the Berne Appendix. The Berne Appendix um, is a complicated um, protocol to the Berne Convention, but in essence, what it does is it says, if you are a developing country, you can apply for a license or an exception that would allow you to produce bulk copies of copyrighted works for educational purposes, um, um, for your domestic consumption. 
That appendix has been a colossal failure for reasons we might discuss during the question and answer period, but that became the face of development in the 1970s, the Byrne Appendix. It was a massive exception from copyright. It allowed you to reproduce mass, um, um, you know, in mass, in bulk. Um, and it allowed you to translate, which was another huge issue. Um, in the United States, the right of translation is often uh, bound up with the right of reproduction um, under our copyright statute. But in many countries, the right of translation is a distinct right. So you might get the work or you might get the book in English, but if you needed to translate it to Hindi, you had to get permission. Um, and so the right of translation became another contested face um, as developing countries began to engage with the national copyright system. The Byrne Appendix did not work well at all. In fact, uh, countries that have used the appendix have been threatened with trade sanctions or that have tried to use it have been threatened with trade sanctions. Those of you who may be familiar with the access to medicines issue, I have often said that somebody looked at the Byrne Appendix and decided this is exactly how we should frame the Doha uh, process right, for access to medicines. Um, if you look at that process and you look at the process of access to, to books, for educational purposes and the way in which the Doha process for access to medicines was designed, you will see almost a complete parallel, right? These systems, and, and of course, both systems have not worked as effectively as they otherwise might. But that introduced the idea that we could create some policy space in copyright law at the international level and that developing countries had the space to do so at the national level. By the 1980s, it was clear this was not working. And the notion of development, that governments had an active responsibility to carve copyright policy to meet the public interest, to meet development needs for the supply of public goods like education, um, really began to fade. Um, and mainly because these countries said the rules are impossible for us to comply with. Um, and what you got was basically developing countries saying, just say no. And that's what they did. They just said no. They neither used the Byrne Appendix, nor did they comply um, really with the Byrne uh, provisions, even though every developing country by then had a copyright law. Those copyright laws were basically templates um, developed by the World Intellectual Property Organization. And often what would happen is you know, a developing country would get an email or back in the day a letter um, saying, uh, you know, we noticed that you don't have uh, copyright laws that are up to date. You're still using the laws of the for, for whatever country you were a colony of. You know, how about we come give you technical assistance? And the idea of aid to developing countries really took the shape in the intellectual property field of these model laws where model laws will be developed for these countries and they would be adopted by many of those countries. And so development basically stopped serving as this viable organizing principle for many of these developing countries. And what we saw and what we continue to see are copyright laws in most of these countries that really do not reflect either the institutional capacity to think about advancing the social welfare. Um, and where that capacity um, is demonstrated, the integration of copyright law in the trade system has created an opportunity for resistance by the developed countries to say, if you issue this license or if you mass reproduce, um, the possibility of being on section 301 list or of reprisals through trade sanctions would be significant. What is changing that is something that I think is very interesting, and that's what I have here on the slide, that the idea that development today, um, after TRIPS, it became a trade-off right, for access to other parts of the global markets. But today, with digital tech copyright issues, we are seeing what I think is a convergence of the social welfare economic growth concerns of the developing countries and the liberal ideals of the developed countries, right? So for those of you who participated in the black off, blackout day for Wikipedia when the SOPA, PIPA debacle was happening in the United States, this was mimicked all over the world, right? Everybody was watching this. People, even consumers that didn't really understand what copyright is, was, or why they should care understood that something that was affecting their capacity to live, to exercise rights of privacy, to have access to, to content, was being threatened. 
And so the idea that liberal values, liberty, privacy, are now converging with these concerns about how do we educate, how do we see the goals of copyright in the sense of the public interest, how do we advance a literate society, those have become, um, uh, have come on paths that I think are converging, and I think this is going to transform in many ways the kinds of interests and objectives that we are gonna see um, in copyright law in the foreseeable future. Um, why? Well, because the reality is that the system is broken, right? None of our theories of copyright when it comes to the developing countries works, right? Um, and frankly, none of our theories for copyright work even for the developed countries, right? The idea that people only innovate because they've got an economic incentive really is not true. Now, industries are built around that incentive structure, but the innate human creativity that that incentive structure creates um, or, or supports is probably going to exist regardless. Um, those of you who uh, want, love to watch Bollywood movies will know that Bollywood um, is a thriving industry. Could it be better with a stronger copyright system? Maybe, maybe not. Nollywood, right? The Nigerian uh, movie industry, thriving um, industry. Arts, crafts, literature. Um, my favorite author, Chinua Achebe, who just passed away here in, 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 in Massachusetts uh, uh, last year, right? A, liter a literary class exists. Um, um, and so it's not clear that there's a strong relationship between what we believe about copyright policy and the reality of creativity um, on the ground. Um, and so it's clear that the propositions that we have articulated for the last 50, 60 years really have not borne out in the empirical studies that are there. And so I think part of what we're seeing um, is that this notion of incentives, which so galvanizes our own system in the United States, um, affects the willingness of the developed countries really to accommodate ways in which developing countries can think about their economic development needs um, without those countries um, uh, coming under fire by the United States and, so, and, and the European Union, quite frankly. Um, and so the, the, the predominance of this incentive structure um, around which we've organized our knowledge, econ uh, our knowledge society and our knowledge economy, it really affects how much we want to experiment with copyright. Are there other systems that might promote innovation and creativity? But most importantly, it, it really takes our utilitarian justifications and pushes to the side the question of human need, the question of cultural values, the question of institutions, and this question of who gets to make public policy in copyright for the rest of the world, right? It overrides, it overrides this ecosystem, as I call it, um, and leaves us, I think, with an international system in which liberal values will be protected in the developed North because strong democratic institutions exist, and where concerns about the supply of public goods concerns about the public interest, the capacity of foreign creators to participate in the global knowledge economy is really hampered by a global regime in which copyright law um, appears only to deal with markets and not really to deal with the public interest concerns that governments might otherwise want to advance. Wonderful. I have to stay turned on apparently. Okay. My, can you hear me? Okay. So uh, thanks very much for highlighting um, effectively the fundamental questions in this field. Uh, as I indicated at the outset, we're now going to uh, incorporate uh, questions um, from the satellite courses and not surprisingly from people who are closely engaged with exactly the issues you flagged. Uh, so the first one, I think, follows directly on um, one of your themes, and in particular, your second slide. So this is from um, uh, Paul uh, Coelho from Tanzania. He's leading the um, satellite there. And he asks, um, 
on behalf of himself and his group, uh, to what extent has the formulation and enforcement of laws, which are TRIPS compliant, proved to be economically beneficial to least and developing countries? So uh, I fear your answer is going to be, at least there's no evidence of benefit. Is this fair? Well, I, I, it, I think it's fair. There's no evidence of benefit. Um, that doesn't mean there's no benefit. Um, I actually have a theory um, that uh, d least developed countries and the developing countries have been spared probably the what I would refer to as the most um, of the, the most horrible of all fates, right, in the copyright world, and that is that in 1994, the internet was just getting off, right? I saw on USA Today it's 25 years um, we're celebrating the internet. But if you look at the TRIPS agreement, you see nothing about digital copyright, right? I mean, so to the extent that the copyright standards of the Berne Convention are extended to the digital environment, absolutely, um, we have some coverage there. But the notice and takedown, the DMCA, um, the question of what constitutes distribution of a digital good, reproduction, translation. There's so many unanswered questions that ending the TRIPS agreement in 1994, two years later, we had two additional international treaties that attempted to close the gap. But if you look at those treaties, they themselves have fallen way short of some of the challenges that we're facing in the digital economy today. And I think that when it comes to development concerns and developing countries, that the digital economy offers an opportunity to experiment in ways that may not be limited by trips. Um, and that is, I think, a great hope. How that will be realized is tough. Um, if you look at um, what's happening around the world, Almost two thirds of the world's population is undergoing copyright reform as we speak. Right? Most countries are in the process of reform, have just finished reform, or about to start reform. And that offers a lot of opportunities. Uh, Brazil, the Brazilian draft copyright uh, statute um, in, as part of their reform process has some amazing um, ideas. I mean, the room to experiment is really, in my view, what development is about. And TRIPS curtails that room in my view, inordinately, but the digital environment that TRIPS doesn't quite adequately penetrate opens it up yet again. And so we may, I think that the glass may be half empty, half full. Now these free trade agreements and the TPP and all of these other agreements may come in and undercut that significantly, but I think that there's an opportunity. So stick with the TPP for a moment. So actually one of our um, online students asked, um, the direction of the question follows immediately thereafter. What effect do you think the proposed IP chapter in the TPP will have on development, in particular in respect to copyright? Will it be a disaster? Will it be beneficial to some countries? I, I cannot think of a single benefit. Um, I'm particularly concerned that this is happening in the context of a trade agreement. And in my view, that is pernicious for copyright in general. Um, if you look at the investment and trade agreements, the, the philosophy, the legal uh, doctrines on which they rest are not quite the same as what we would argue is part and parcel of what the copyright system is supposed to do. And so, in fact, uh, there has been an insistence recently by industry, by copyright industries, that the developing countries not only have to protect these minimum rights, but they have to undertake to devote resources to enforce them. So it's become a system in which developing countries are going to be asked to subsidize the rights, the economic interests of the industry. And that is very disturbing um, um, in my view. I think it's one thing to say we ought to have a legal system in which rights holders can pursue um, enforcement. I think it's a completely different thing to require countries, A, to invest public resources into that, disproportionately to their own citizens, and or B, to require that the domestic policy for copyright law be anchored to the interests of foreign industries. I think that is 
taking us back in time, not forward. So putting these two issues together, if I, if I get it right, your answer to Paul's question from Tanzania was that um, things are not so bad, ironically, because the major treaty in this area, the TRIPS agreement, uh, fails to address some of the most important zones of um, uh, creativity and, and economic activity that copyright affects, leaving um, individual countries room to experiment, which they are now doing. And the TPP then would um, encroach upon that latitude. It would be, in part, a uh, extension into the digital arena of the kind of um, tighter uh, protectionist hand that the TRIPS agreement um, has avoided just because it was negotiated a long time ago. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, OK, great. So you mentioned a minute ago um, one of the countries where the experimentation is going on is Brazil. And we also have um, a satellite in Brazil um, run by Ronaldo Lemos, who I think you know. Yes, um, hi, Ronaldo. Where are we? Uh, <laughs> out there somewhere, right. Uh -huh. um, so he um, has a question. He and his group have a question involving the development agenda with the <gasps> White Pope. So uh, well. It would be very helpful if you explain how that got going. Uh, and his question has to do with um, effectiveness. Um, has it been influential um, in the processes of national copyright reform? He can probably speak to that in Brazil, but you can speak to that in elsewhere and as to other countries. And uh, uh, his last question implies an answer to the first one. Um, what could be done to make the development agenda more effective? Oh, boy. Hard questions. So um, have you all covered the development agenda? No. At all? OK. So it turns out it's not really an agenda. <laughs> and it turns out that it may not be about development either, which sort of uh, <laughs> begs the question, where did we get this name from? I um, was very excited about the development agenda when, when the discussions about this started in Geneva. And as usual. Uh, Brazil was uh, sort of the ringleader. Um, and it, it really was an idea that developing countries had right after uh, the TRIPS agreement, of course. But it was about institutional reform. Remember, I mentioned in my presentation that the World Intellectual Property Organization played a, a, a significant role in getting developing countries integrated into the international copyright system in a way that ultimately has not yielded much benefit for these countries. Um, and there's a whole apparatus of technical assistance. I mean, uh, WIPO works principally through technical assistance to these countries. Um, and that assistance is very much tailored around a vision of copyright. Um, that is consistent with what industry priorities are with, with very little consideration of what's happening domestically, what, what are the needs, um, what's the history, what's the culture, what are the political institutions, what sorts of um, needs, social interest needs might require a different kind of copyright law nationally. So it, 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 it was a template-driven approach to technical assistance. And so the development agenda um, really, and in fact, there is now a group within WIPO called the Development Agenda Group, which takes positions on issues in the organization um, from a development perspective. And the idea was to represent the concern of developing countries that much of the technical assistance happening through WIPO um, was not a reflection of the needs of developing countries. It was to require that WIPO think about the development dimension of every activity and every major initiative, to think about the disparate or disproportionate interests, different interests of its member states, rather than to have a one-size-fits-all approach, um, and to be much more tailored in its advice to developing countries. So it consists of clusters of activities. Um, and as you might imagine, as lawyers, every word in the development agenda uh, uh, document is critiqued. Um, debated, what does it mean, how do you implement it? Um, the result, frankly, on net has been that it has been an important rhetorical tool. It's been an important uh, a rallying cry, but practical effects in terms of norms have been 
very minimal. And um, for those of you who are, who are really interested in, in copyright and the political economy of copyright and IP more generally, Carolyn Deere's book on the TRIPS implementation game is a very interesting, very insightful, and probably the leading work on this question because it tells you really exactly how these developing countries get the laws that they get. Because if you look at the statutes alone, many developing and least developed countries have stronger copyright regimes on the books than the United States does. So I call it the triumph of TRIPS, right? So to the extent that TRIPS was about fix your laws, TRIPS was very successful. To the extent that TRIPS is about balancing copyright norms and addressing development in as much as you create protection for authors and industries, um, I think the evidence is, is slim. So the bottom line is I think the development agenda um, opens up some rhetorical space, which is often very important in the political economy context. Um, it does have the um, effect of creating some accountability within WIPO to say, well, tell us how this in fact reflects the interests of these countries. Um, but it is not a tool, really, I think, for transforming the system. So the innovation then that um, Brazil manifests is not a fruit of the collective enterprise of the development agenda. It just reflects the um, energy insight and size of Brazil as an innovator in this space? Well, in part, but I think it also um, confirms a couple of things. One, that when the developing countries um, assert a level of moral um, accountability from the system, that there inevitably has to be some space. So the development agenda, in my view, in many ways, um, was possible despite opposition from the developed countries, in part because we were in the moment of a moral crisis about access to medicines and people dying because of patents. And people began to say, well, wait a second. People are dying because they can't get access to medicines. And people are going to be committed to a lifetime of poverty and underdevelopment because they have no access to public goods for education, for social engagement, et cetera. And the relationship between copyright and, and, and democratic engagement um, took off because the NGOs were, were, were really rallying around this question of, can a group of private industries in the developed North determine the law for the rest of the world in a way that keeps the rest of the world impoverished, whether it's physically or intellectually or socially or culturally? And I think that, I mean, and that's speaking pretty broadly and dramatically, but I think that moral moment made it possible, created a, a space politically to do something like the development agenda. And, and I, I've written that you know, it's either a constitutional change for WIPO, or it's simply a stake in the ground in the process towards getting a, a meaningful recalibration of interests um, um, domestically. So Brazil worked with uh, Venezuela, with the Africa group. One thing I should tell you um, all is that within WIPO, um, the activities are organized around blocks of countries. So the Africa group represents all of the African countries. Um, group B uh, is the US, the EU, Australia, the developed countries. Um, and um, then we have now the DAG group, the development agenda group. Um, and so statements are made, initiatives are all processed through these groupings of countries. One more, I think, closely related question. This one is from Adefe Ajomo in Nigeria, who you also, I think, ah. know. Um, this, she's online right now, so this one is live. Uh, just wondering how the need to actually enforce copyright laws in developing countries will affect economic development in those countries and how the international system can address this. Mm. Many of the concerns here in Nigeria have more to do with protection than access sharing. So this seems to highlight two dimensions, this question seems to me anyway, to highlight two dimensions, what you've just mentioned. Uh, the first is um, sometimes puzzling, sometimes ironic divisions within developing countries between groups that are um, interested in amplifying the entitlements of creators uh, who may be closer to the centers of power within those countries. 
And then the other dimension you mentioned earlier is the uh, sharp difference between obligations to put laws on the book and obligations to enforce. Um, with the threat of um, dispute resolution procedures and trade sanctions, uh, the pressure that can be brought to bear in developing countries to put laws on the books is now post-trips pretty sizable. But less clear that um, the uh, uh, effort, either under the auspices of TRIPS or under the TPP, to require genuine enforcement will be efficacious. Mm -hmm. So those are, I think, our deaf face questions. What do you think? Yeah. Um, it's, this to me is probably the, the larger tragedy, is that there is, in my view, a very strong relationship between having a robust civil society, a robust um, democratic um, culture. The relationship between that and strong judicial institutions is, is going to be vital in the next 10, 15 years. Because to the extent that the agencies, all agencies are subject to capture, even in the developing countries. And so to the extent that these copyright offices have been significantly influenced, whether by WIPO or by uh, political pressures or whatever the case may be, um, the pushback is going to have to come from consumers, from, from consumers, from educational institutions, um, libraries, um, disaffected groups whose um, sense, of, um, uh, sense of engagement has really been um, uh, challenged uh, because of the lack of access. So enforcement, in my view, um, needs to come at a cost. Enforcement needs to be costly for the industry, politically costly and morally costly. So that there should be no question, for example, that um, if there is a, sort of a mega upload kind of situation, that that crosses the line. But I think when, uh, um, to use an example close to home, a law professor you know, circulates a three minute clip of, of you know, somebody's musical recording um, and gets you know, a cease and desist letter, uh, this is unacceptable. It's unacceptable and there needs to be pushback. And in my view, I was just asked, uh, there is a case in India now that I was asked to opine on, on uh, course packs, right, the, the copyright um, question about course packs, which is now, of course, a huge issue in India. And it's a huge issue in India, remember, because as I said during my presentation, the translation right in many countries is a separate right that the copyright owner has. So even if you had um, you know, a license to reproduce a work, you would have to negotiate a translation license as well. Right? So the, the transaction costs of even compliance is so high that it makes it difficult for even those who are willing to comply to invest in that. So we have to do two things, Terry. I think we need to have a system where compliance costs are low enough that compliance is, is, is not itself a barrier to, to accessing uh, creative works, but we also have to have a moral filter through which the overreaching of the industry um, can, be, can be addressed by consumers themselves. Because at the end of the day, we are getting to a copyright system in which what you do is linked to the gizmos that we all carry around, our phones, our tablets, or what, chips that might be embedded in us. And the idea that your use of these things in the privacy of your homes, your expression through these intermediaries, um, your ability to engage in, in the culture is determined whether it's by code or by copyright law, I think is something that in the developed country setting and developing country setting, consumers are, in, are increasingly going to say no. Great. OK, so one more question from the satellite community. Um, you've emphasized several times the advantages of um, leaving in the hands of individual developing countries the power to experiment, to address um, the uh, sometimes conflicting uh, needs for increased incentives. Um, and the importance of affording opportunities for access and innovation simultaneously and give them discretion and freedom to experiment, uh, particularly with respect to the digital environment. 
So um, another person I think you know, Helen Chumo Okoro in Nigeria, who teaches along with uh, Adefe, the satellite there, um, reminds us that there is an experiment of this sort going on in Nigeria right now. Uh, presumably not required by any of the multilateral agreements. It's an initiative of the sort you were uh, celebrating a minute ago. And the initiative, in brief, is to uh, impose a tax upon uh, devices that can be employed to violate the copyright laws, a minor tax, but a tax nevertheless, ranging from 1% to 3%, and then use the money to uh, offset the injuries sustained by the ubiquity of file sharing or copying. Uh, and the uh, distribution mechanism is perhaps the most controversial of the dimensions of this initiative. Uh, as Helen reports, um, the new directive in, uh, mandates 10% going for the promotion of creativity. That's quite similar to your European style mm -hmm. directive. 20% for anti-piracy programs of the Nigerian Copyright Commission. 10% for administrative purposes to be shared equally among all government agencies, and then 60% to the collecting societies, presumably for distribution to their members. Uh, so she asks, what do you think of this system? <laughs> uh, and I think embedded in that, are, I would supplement it by asking two aspects of it. Um, does it make sense in general to be um, supplementing or conceivably displacing copyright with tax and distribution mechanisms. The more focused question, which is I think the one Helen needs to concentrate on, is what about the specific Nigerian version? Is this particular variant of that idea sensible? Helen is trying to get me in trouble. <laughs> so um, I have a fundamental problem with levies in general. It's a very European style um, uh, approach really to the copyright system, but um, you will find that many developing countries, especially former British uh, colonies, as, tend to follow this approach. And so levies are sort of, uh, any government loves to tax. So this, you know, it's, it's basically a tax. Um, what concerns me is that this is not gonna displace copyright, um, but will actually simply be layered on top of copyright. So the average consumer in Nigeria will be paying uh, double taxes, right? So, so whatever that consumer pays to get the permission to utilize the work and whatever that um, tax that is levied on the purchase of the goods themselves. Now, a couple of things. My understanding is that there's gonna be some opposition to this from civil society. And so we, I don't believe it's come into um, existence yet. I think it still needs to be signed off, but it's making its way through. Um, and I'm quite disturbed by it on, on many different levels. But the first is the fact that broadband capacity um, in most of Africa cannot support peer-to-peer -peer on, on a good day. So this tax is, in effect, not a tax on peer-to-peer -peer or the capacity to copy. It's, it's just a flat, plain tax unrelated to copyright. Um, and I think that they're actually, you know, so the folks that are thinking about opposition are going to probably have some good legal grounds um, for this. Because the, the, the technological infrastructure for, for um, the kind of sharing that is contemplated simply does not exist. Be that as it may. My second concern, of course, is um, the fact that this may disincentivize the creation of effective distribution channels for copyrighted content, right? Um, Nollywood is now either the second or the third largest producing um, movie sector, cultural sector in the world. Um, and the real issue is distribution networks, right, which have not been developed. And the idea that this is a backdoor way to replace that is, I think, not well thought through from a policy perspective. The third thing, of course, that um, I'm concerned about is that I think this may actually be a violation of, of international copyright law because it doesn't speak about the distribution of this tax to foreign copyright owners which if you, outside of music and Nollywood, one might presume 
that the content that is being shared, when it can be shared, if it can be shared, is non-local content. Mm. So then what is the um, mechanism for distribution to non-local um, creators? That would violate the national treatment rule. Um, it would create lots of problems. And so I actually think that the uh, plan is not as well thought out. And that if, in fact, there is resistance to it from civil society, that um, we may get a little bit of a retreat and maybe a better approach to um, the question of uh, digital initiatives from the Copyright Commissions. Got it. OK. Questions? Jessica? Yeah, that would be a great idea. Hi, um, I'm Jessica, and I would like to ask about the treaty that many developing countries are calling for in WIPO relating to traditional knowledge and I believe it's genetic material um, in the, the recognition and protection of it. And a, a common criticism coming from developed countries is that it conflicts with the, the call for you know, broader flexibilities and exceptions. And coming from you know, the US system, which is ostensibly duration-based, it does sound kind of troubling that something, you know, information that's been around for so long would then be protected. And we also have this di idea of a dichotomy that doesn't necessarily have to be the case, but where, um, you know, robust exceptions and flexibilities go hand in hand with a larger public domain. Mm -hmm. And um, and then on the other side, narrower, both. Um, so my question is, could you respond to that criticism? And how would this, if, if this were you know, to come about, how would, it, what, how would it function? What would it look like to protect you know, um, folk, mm -hmm. uh, folk knowledge? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, thank you. Great. Thanks, Jessica. Um, <laughs> to talk about stirring the hornet's nest. <laughs> So the, the treaty that Jessica is uh, um, talking about is, is a treaty that is being demanded by the developing countries uh, for the protection of genetic resources, uh, folklore, uh, traditional cultural expressions. Um, and this is, I think, for you as, as, as lawyers and law students um, thinking about this field, um, it probably is the best reflection of the, of the normative chaos in the field and what I call premature harmonization. So you know that in our uh, copyright statute, the 1976 Copyright Act, um, we only protect fixed works, right? Um, and fixation has actually never been a requirement of international copyright law, um, even though many countries have some form of it. Not as hard as the US doctrine, but some form of perceptibility of the work. Many developing countries um, do not um, are not literary um, in the sense of the written word, right? Many traditions are oral. And in fact, when I was uh, Professor Fisher's student, one of my big complaints was that we've created a copyright system in which uh, the vast majority of the world will never participate because these are not written traditions. They are oral traditions. And the question is whether or not oral creativity, oral literature, is that to be as valued as the written word? Right, um, and so there's a there's a there's a sort of moral question about the way in which copyright law was designed around the economics of the printing press, and the culture, the written culture of the developed West, um, to the exclusion of many um, indigenous groups and uh, other cultures that are not written. Now, that is creating problems because you may also know, if you've gotten that far in, in copyright, that constitutionally in the United States, we cannot protect unfixed work. So we are uh, uh, constrained in that way. But you may recall that as a result of the TRIPS agreement, we did enact legislation amending the copyright statute, recognizing copyright protection in performances um, to prevent bootleg recordings, unfixed. And when this was challenged in court, um, what did the court say? Well, Congress may not be able to do this under the IP clause, but they could certainly do it under the Commerce Clause. So clearly, we have the capacity to, through legal innovation, work around our own constitutional constraints. And the question many of the 11 countries are asking is, well, why can you protect unfixed works, 
and choose not to extend that to oral literature. All right? So there, there's sort of a, a little bit of a, of a concern about whether this is a lack of equality in valuing the kind of knowledge that comes from certain parts of the world, um, or rather devaluing the kind of knowledge that comes from certain parts of the world and valuing uh, certain forms of knowledge uh, differently. The second thing, of course, is our, our approach in the United States to moral rights. Um, and I don't know if you've gotten to moral rights yet, but you know that the Europeans have a strong moral rights system, which is really the thing that distinguishes uh, common law copyright from continental copyright, which is to say it, these are inalienable rights, they are non-economic rights, um, and that's something that is pretty much anathema for us in common law countries. This moral rights tradition is very much in alignment with what developing countries want for folklore because much folklore is generated in a sort of a spiritual context. And so the idea that you can take, say, the Maori of New Zealand, so you can take um, a Maori folk song used for traditional healing rituals and commercialize that into a rap song in Hollywood and then expect that the New Zealand government should allow that CD or those digital files to be downloaded in New Zealand is quite offensive to the, to the kind of values associated with that kind of music. So these are just examples of the way in which certain forms of knowledge have just historically and systematically been excluded from the intellectual property system. And this demand, as I see it, in many ways is an attempt to both fix the idea that only certain kinds of knowledge should be protected by IP and by copyright, and also to say there are values beyond the economic values that the international system needs to recognize. Because fundamentally what countries want is the right to say, if you have misappropriated traditional knowledge from a community and, that, and, and you've commercialized it, that country wants to be able to either A, stop those goods from coming into the country and require their trade partners to stop that, and B, fundamentally, if it's not offensive, say they have a right to share in the proceeds. Whether they have a right to share the proceeds or not is, is, is a separate question, but fundamentally they want to be able to control their own knowledge systems. And I think that's really what's at the root of that. Um, the argument is that, well, all this is in the public domain. It's all in the public domain. Well, remember that when the United States ratified the Berne Convention, what did we do? Things that were in the public domain that had fallen into the public domain because of a failure to comply with formalities, what did we do? We restored copyright to those things. So again, I think the, it's very difficult to make an argument that is consistent with certainly practice in recent history for why developing countries ought not to be demanding that their knowledge systems be protected, that they be entitled to restoration, and that simply because we were former colonies does not mean that our knowledge that was appropriated is in the public domain. And so we're having a conversation. I'm heading to Geneva for this exact conversation next week. Here's a question from the online audience. It actually comes from two people who share an orientation. This is from um, Siddharth and um, Subro. They, um, in different ways, ask a question that might be, I'm inserting my own interpretation here, conceived of as a matter of substance or a matter of rhetoric and strategy. And the issue is why do we um, formulate approaches uh, that cater to the needs of, quote, the global south separately? Shouldn't we be instead lobbying for principles that are more universal in their application to satisfy the real needs of systems across all countries? That is a fantastic question, and I completely uh, concur. I, it, as I said in one of my slides, I think what we are at the cusp of is a convergence of what we view as development, sort of the economic face of development, and the interests of consumers in, in developed countries for greater access, less constrained access, the capacity to sing in the shower and have people gather outside and hear you singing and not be afraid that you're going to be sued for a public performance, right? The sorts of things that we take for granted, you know, that forwarding email should not raise any copyright questions, that, that I ought to be able to, to um, you know, take music that I've purchased from iTunes on, on my phone and, and transport that to, to my laptop, right? Space shifting and, and device shifting, things that your generation takes for granted and our generation is taken for granted that we think it's just part of life. In fact, we think we're entitled to it, right? I mean, 
know, you tell the average teenager you, you cannot download this and, and they'll look at you and say, well, why? Right? And then I, I keep telling my friends in the industry, your attempt to sort of persuade a generation this is immoral is not working. So we need to think about alternative <laughs> strategies, right? Because I don't think they're persuaded by the morality issue of th that they're stealing, right? Um, so there are ways in which, uh, Julie Cohen has just written a book on um, the network society and the network self. And, um, and many folks are beginning to, Madhavi Sunder at UC Davis about copyright and social justice, are beginning to say, this is not about the South versus the North. This is about human, the human capacity for creativity, the human interests in liberty, the recognition that there ought to be some boundaries, but that those boundaries need to be negotiated in ways that are both sensible, um, but that also allow governments to meet um, the supply of global public goods meaningfully. I think that question is correct, but I do not want to lose sight of the fact that we are talking about economically um, weaker countries. And that what you need 50 years after independence, which is for much of Africa where that's the average independent uh, uh, you know, age, 50 years after independence, what you need will be different from what you need 150 years after independence or 250 years after independence. And so there should always be some capacity to recognize that. And if that means that we tinker with doctrines like exhaustion or parallel importation or public domain or whatever, then we do that. But I think we cannot hide the fact that copyright law is a government policy. And it is a government policy to accomplish particular interests. And those interests include incentivizing industries around knowledge goods and ensuring that the public engages with those goods so that we produce a society in which people are politically engaged, in which people are expressing their, liber their liberty, um, um, uh, their freedoms and their liberty interests, um, and in which the economics can then derive from um, an openness in a way that currently is not the case. Adam. Hello, I'm Adam Holland. I'm one of the, the TS for the online course. I was wondering, just in light of what you were just saying about the implicitly shifting moralities involved with digital copyright and that the industry's attempts to convince the newest generation that their behavior is immoral or not gaining any traction. If you could perhaps back up a bit and link that to what I was fascinated by, your discussion of how moral outrage inflection points can provide a space within which to push back. So if on the one hand, what do you mean we don't have access to medicine is this tragic but fertile opportunity to push back, but on the other hand, making it about morality isn't effective. Is there a middle ground to be found there, and how can we best leverage moral or social welfare concerns to create reform? That's great. Great question. Thanks, Adam. Um, yeah, moral, these questions about morality are always a two-edged sword, right? Um, um, but I'm convinced that the the moral outrage of the public is going to remain vital for the way in which copyright um, uh, regimes are, are formed or informed um, in the foreseeable future. Let me back up a little bit and say that what is clear as a result of, of both SOPA and PIPA, um, some of the uh, TPP um, debacles that have happened, the fact that it was leaked, um, the idea that you can have international negotiations that are done in secret with little or no public participation um, you know, is outrageous to, to a lot of folks. And so it's clear that the landscape post-TRIPS, this is not an environment in which we would probably have succeeded in getting the TRIPS agreement. The agreement that we have today would likely not have been possible had the public been this aware, been this engaged, of the insidiousness of IP norms in the way average citizens live their lives. And I think that this, is, this was the waking moment 
right? The idea that, gosh, I can't go to Wikipedia. I'm not, you know, if, if Google feels as bad about it or Wikipedia or all these folks are doing this blackout, oh my goodness. Like I said, most people didn't, you know, if you asked one of those 8 million folks that, that sent or called Congress, well, why are you calling? They had their script. But if you sort of had a dialogue with them, all they knew was there's something about the way that I interact with my Kindle or I get on YouTube or whatever the case may be that I'm no longer going to be able to do. Um, and it is forcing us to think about why copyright law is driven by sectoral interests and not by the kind of critically informed debate that you would expect of a policy that is so fundamental to what average consumers do on a daily basis. And that is, a, that is a gap that is problematic in the developed countries and in the developing countries. And in the past, it didn't matter because nobody enforced it. Nobody had the capacity to enforce it, nobody enforced it, nobody cared. Now that in, the enforcement um, um, weapon is so strong, people care. People care that your internet service provider can shut you down. People care that your three-second clip of a Prince song on YouTube you know, generates a lawsuit. People care that sending musical works to your students as part of a classroom experience um, is, is problematic. So the sense of moral outrage is going to be one that really says, A, we have a legal regime that is not about the authors themselves. And I think that gap is fundamental to the moral outrage. That if this was the starving artist in California getting the $100, most people would be like, okay, listen, I'll pay you 10, you know, they would negotiate. If this was about the, the you know, Charles Dickens, you know, sort of saying, oh my God, you know, I spent my whole life writing these amazing novels and you know, they're being sold for 10 cents and you know, I'm not getting anything, people, there would be some empathy. But I think part of what has happened is that we have a legal infrastructure completely divorced from the individual groups and cultures that it is meant to reflect. And that dissonance is what's creating the moral space for the larger public to say, we don't really empathize with your model of you know, a Hollywood movie for $60 billion, but the actors get this, the screenwriter gets almost nothing, the musical works get... That dissonance, I think, creates the room for moral outrage. And I think the more we can think about copyright reform as bridging the gap between people who are really creating and their ability to access the economic rent from those works, the less there will be space for moral outrage. But the more it's about industry interests, um, and less about getting returns to the authorial class, the more that outrage, I think, is going to be uh, fairly significant. Um, and I think the outrage in the copyright context is very different from the outrage in the big pharma context. I think that's an appropriate place to stop. Thank you very much. Thank you.